Hello, everyone. I am here today with Adele Ravella, who is the CEO of Buyer Persona Institute and author of Buyer Personas, How to Gain Insight into Your Customers' Expectations, Align Your Marketing Strategies, and Win More Business. And it was recently named a top five business book by Fortune Magazine. Adele's unique perspective derives from decades of experience as a sales and marketing executive, trainer, researcher, and entrepreneur. And today, we're going to be talking about buyer personas. We have them built. Now what? Adele, how are you doing today? I'm doing just great. Thanks for asking me back, David. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to continue to. <laughs> so uh, you, you were wonderful to talk with, a lot of insight, and uh, there's um, a lot to talk about regarding this just buyer personas. I mean, it's it's almost an endless amount of topics. Uh, so um, I loved, uh, loved our last session and, and looking forward to many more. So um, to kind of just dig right in with everything, I, I would like to just do a quick review of what a buyer persona is, and also just for the listeners out there, you, you can uh, find this recent podcast that we did that specifically dug into this, but I would like to go ahead and just give a quick review before we move forward. Okay, great. Uh, did, 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 were you, did you want to ask me a question about that? or? Yeah, just a quick review on what, just uh, define what a buyer okay. persona is, um, sure. the correct buyer persona. Sure. So uh, most people think that a buyer persona describes the person that they want to market to, and, and this is part of, the answer, part of the correct answer. A buyer persona is essentially an example uh, that allows you to understand your, the buyers that you want to market to or sell to so that you can be more um, effective at, at influencing their decisions. Uh, the part that we talked about a lot in the last podcast that I encourage people to go back and listen to it if they have a lot of questions about that is that most people, when they do buyer personas, they get overly focused on who the person is and what their goals are and you know, all, maybe can even get deep into some of the psychology of the buyer and all of these attitudes of the buyer. And, and that's fine, but it's probably 10% of what we need to know. The most important part of the buyer persona is understanding how, when, and why that person, that buyer, makes the decision to leave the status quo, you know, whether they're using a current product or buying one for the first time, and, and actually make the decision that now's the time to go do an evaluation and, and buy something new. And gotcha. so that's that's the place where buyer personas really start to have a huge impact on, on marketing strategies, sales strategies. Mm -hmm. And that's really what say has separated um, you and, and why you were named a top five business book by Fortune Magazine is because you've taken it to the next level. You know, you took what traditionally what was called a buyer persona and you're like, well, no, not quite. It's not just the person. It's the buyer's journey plus that person. So, yeah, that's that's uh, really where you separate yourself and you have such a deep understanding and, and – um, I think you've done a lot of good by helping a lot of people understand that difference. So uh, like we both mentioned, you, uh, we won't spend too much time digging into that exactly. You can go back and listen to that. But So now let's assume we have the buyer persona spilt. You've gone through the process of creating them. Now what are the next steps to best use the information that you've gathered after going through that process? Great. And and. So this is perfect because, you know, most people say, hey, we've got our buyer personas done and we're going to make posters and put them on the intranet and share them at meetings. And, um, and that's not the next best step. Uh, actually, what we've discovered is that while it's okay to distribute your personas, most people in your organization aren't really going to change their behavior, aren't going to do anything differently as a result of just sharing who your buyer is and what you've learned about how they make buying decisions. So the, the, what you want to do next, in, is, and there's a number of places to go, but we think the most important next step is to develop new uh, ways to approach your buyer in terms of your content strategy and your messaging based on everything you've learned about the attitudes and perceptions your buyers have about this decision. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you're, I mean, that, that's kind of a strategy. So what would you suggest, like, if you're a company and you have that done, should you, should there be, like, a, a you know, a big meeting where you review everything? You know, how many people should be involved in that? Who should be involved in that? You know, just trying to give some people some direction on, you know, yeah. some, some next, some hard next steps that they can, that they can apply in real life. Yeah, so I think what, what we what we recommend, and, and I wrote about this extensively in the book, but I'll explain it today on this call, is that you find four to six experts in your company who understand exactly what you can and can't do. So, you know, it's really interesting. We find a lot of marketing people are sort of been drinking the Kool-Aid and we think we can do anything, but we try to get people like product managers or or – you know, people that have been really close to the product and solution and will be real about what we can actually deliver uh, uh -huh. in a room, in a room with um, maybe at least one person who knows the competitive landscape pretty well. And so uh -huh. this might be somebody in sales ops or maybe you have a competitive intelligence person. and Or sometimes product managers know the competitive environment. And uh -huh. so four to six people in a room, and your buyer persona, if you've done it the way we talked about in our last podcast, is going to take you through five different categories of insight into what affects the buyer's decision to choose you. So it's going to tell you maybe four or five triggers that cause buyers, we call that the priority initiative insight, that cause buyers to say, hey, we want to invest now. And uh -huh. it's going to have four or five insights, maybe more around, the benefits that buyers care about, and it's going to have several insights around the objections buyers have and the obstacles they face. And we're going to take, and it's going to, then it's going to have many insights, maybe six or seven or eight, around all the attributes of your company and your product and your service that buyers evaluate. So now you might have a list of 30 things that buy that you now know from your research affect your buyer's decision, and they're basically the questions buyers are asking when they're on, their, on your website or they're engaging with your salespeople or they're having any kind of marketing interaction, they're saying, you know, can this company address my priorities? Is it going to give me the outcome I expect? How can they help me overcome these uh, obstacles I have to success? And and are they qualified to deliver the capabilities and functions and features and services I need? And since we know every single one of those and we've got verbatim quotes about every single one of those 30 or 40 things that factor into the buyer's decision, we can now sit in a room with our internal subject matter experts and we can work through the, each of those 30 or 40 things one at a time and write a statement of capability that would just wow the socks off of that buyer, that would directly and specifically answer that buyer's concerns about whether or not they're, you're going to be able to deliver what they need or whether or not you're going to deliver the benefit or outcome they care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that's... Um that's what we're trying to do, right? Yeah, and if you're able to do that, uh, you know, everything you do will have, uh, you know, a higher, uh, a higher success rate. You know, every every ad, every message, everything. And you know, if you start getting, you know, a few extra percentages in your favor across all the different areas, it, it adds up quick. I think I heard somewhere the difference for, uh, between a small business's success and failure is five percent. And if you can, you know, start gobbling up some of those, five, you know, those percentages, uh, this is the place to do it. And it's with, the, it's with your effective messaging, but it's like, how can we get there? And uh, that's, that's obviously what Adele's been helping many businesses with uh, over the years. Now, in regards to that, where do companies sometimes fall just short of hitting the mark with this messaging? I, I think you gave an example of uh, discovering that in your book, of discovering that buyers were reluctant to invest in solutions that might become obsolete in a few years. And then the messaging that you gave, the incorrect messaging, or you know, messaging that might not quite cut it, was we have the flexibility to design a solution that meets your needs now and in the future. And that's a bit of a platitude. <laughs> what can you give? You know, some insight on that, some help with that, because yeah. I, I really feel like. That's probably the norm right there. 
And exactly. we're all trying to not be normal like that, at least like yeah. that. <laughs> so uh, well, let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it really does go back to the research itself, the research phase, because when if you did the interviews correctly with your buyers, that summary headline, like we're concerned about whether you're going to be able to address our needs in the future, is accompanied by in-depth quotes from buyers where they talked about what they thought their needs might be in the future and specifically what, what they needed to hear from the company in order to believe that they could actually achieve that. And, and so when you're in this workshop, and we, you know, we, we take about eight hours to do this workshop with clients, we want, it, we want you to sit there and, and read every one of those verbatim quotes that relates to that key finding around, you know, this, the future-proof aspect and say, what, are we, what, is, what is the buyer really concerned about here? And let's get much more specific about how we're going to not just say, oh, yeah, we can do that. Because everybody, it's, my favorite one is ease of use. You know, I go to websites, and everybody says their products are easy to use. And so I, you know, it's, it's almost laughable to think that the buyer would go to your site and say those words and go, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is the answer to my dreams. This company's product is easy to use. It, it's how are we going to provide proof about our future? You know, how are we going to provide evidence? And if we, when we do the interviews and we get buyers to talk about that in depth, They'll give us clues. And now, again, we're sitting in this meeting with our subject matter experts, and we're looking at those clues, and we're saying, you know, what can we as a company, how can we answer this? Um, I, you, I think you've had Marcus Sheridan on your show before, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple few times. And he's got a book coming out called They Ask, We Answer. That's the title of his new book. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I love Marcus. He's got a little different approach than we do because he doesn't really do this kind of research the way we do. But still, the principle is, and what's made Marcus so successful, is when he was in the swimming pool business, you know, he looked at every hard question customers asked, and then he started building content to answer those questions. Uh -huh. and, and what we're really doing here in this implementation phase of buyer personas is we're doing the same thing. We're sitting down with a group of people that know what we can really do, and we're saying, hey, these are the questions buyers are asking. How can we answer these? And, and, that's the, the, and then that can feed into everything else you're doing. It can feed into all your marketing. It can feed into your sales training, your sales playbooks. But the core is don't just stop with the persona and send that out. Um, get the answers to the questions that you want people to deliver. And now what you're distributing Sure, you can send them the persona, but you can say, and here's our response. Here's what we're doing about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I love how you put this. <clears throat> I believe you said, effective messaging emerges at the intersection of what your buyers want to hear and what you want to say. And it's not one or the other. It's the intersection of those two. So yeah. I think if you are – kind of out there and trying to put it together and still like, well, I need some examples, just draw <laughs> draw two circles, you know, and start, you know, see what intersects of what you want to say and all the information you gathered, you know, what it looks like buyers want to hear and start there. Would you, would you say that would be a very good place to kind of help people who are still like, I'm trying to get past the platitude, you know, how can I do that? Yeah. I, um, I feel like that yeah. really directs people in a good direction. Yeah, and or make a list, you know, because it's I, I do I do it with a Venn diagram, and I think you saw that in the book, but you know, where there's two overlapping circles. But the practical step is now you've got a list from your persona of everything your buyer wants to hear, and you know everything you want to say, and so start matching those things up. Sit down and you know build a table and say, okay, here's something that the buyer wants to hear, and we go over and we look at what we have to say, and we. And we say, ah, oh, there's a good match here. But, and then you start to look at what you want to say, and you said, wait a minute, the way we answered that, is that really differentiate us, the way we uh -huh. said that? And, and how, because, you know, being able to say that we're easy to use or sure our product's future-proof, anybody could say that. Uh -huh. So now what you're doing is 
you're kind of starting to inspect all your statements that are and saying, well, how can we talk about our ability to be easy to use or future proof in a way that it would be hard for our competitors to make that to answer that question for the buyer because your buyer is out asking these questions of every company that they're considering. So you want to not only answer their questions, but you want to answer them in a way that's unique. And sometimes it's not so much that you do it differently. It's the fact that you were willing to get past the platitudes, your word, David, and, and really get into the details of how you do that. Sometimes it's just the mere fact that your marketing got smarter and you were willing. You didn't just say, hey, we're easy to use. You actually started proving it to people and talking about what you do to make it easy to use or having videos around how it's easy to use or, or talking about the level of R&D commitment you have to future-proof the solution, you know, something that's, that your competitors aren't doing that will help you stand out from the massive morass of, of, of companies that are all competing for the same business and all using the same jargon to answer your buyer's questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah, that's actually something you kind of touched on. Something I was gonna, we were gonna dig into in a little bit. But yeah, I mean, just to kind of reiterate that, you know, the you know, I can imagine a ton of situations where there's other great companies who can offer what you can, just as you can offer what they can. You know, you mm-hmm. very, very rarely you're gonna have some unique and patented idea where. The yeah. world's just your oyster. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent is there's other people who do what you do, and that's okay. The, the world's a big yeah. place, and it's not a scarce place. It's an abundant place, and there's enough business to go around for everybody. So that's fine. But what you're saying is how you know it's hard to. I mean, we got to try to figure it out and, and do it in you know the shorter messaging. But what you're saying is a good way for people that can try to stand out and explain themselves better. Is kind of you know the market sharing way. They ask you answer. Go go the content marketing route. Go the long form content. Start answering those questions, and that alone can start to distinguish and separate yourself from others. That's kind of what you were. What, what basically that's one example or one way you gave for people to um, to kind of get past the you know these all these people are all the same. Is that is that kind of exactly something? exactly. Cool. Yeah. And we've Very all cool. had that experience because we all buy. You know, we're, we're all buyers, and we go out, mm-hmm. and you know what it's like. You go out. I mean, you've done this, David. You go out, and you start searching around for something you want. You're going to go on a cool vacation, or you want to buy a new bicycle or or whatever, and you start doing a search. And, and gosh, the sites that, that really give you the answers to your questions that actually go beyond the obvious and tell you something that you that was interesting and helpful to you. And so, mm-hmm. you know, this isn't a new idea. Marketers know they need to be helpful. They know they need to be interesting. But we try to solve that problem by being more creative or using better copywriters. And what I'm saying is is that the buyer persona gives us a different way to look at standing out because we now have this – it's, it's, somebody said to me once, it's almost like cheating. You know, we've asked the buyers what they want to learn about when they're on the website because we've, uh-huh. we've interviewed them. And now mm-hmm. we go give that to them, you know. I'm like, yeah. And, and it does feel a little bit like cheating, and that's why I do this. You know, I'm not that creative, frankly, David. So <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm going to find a way to cheat. I'm going to go get the buyers to tell me what they want to hear about, and then we'll just do that. <laughs> that's a fun way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And I, and just a real life example for me, I, you know, I'm digging into a couple of um, analytical keyword analytical type of tools, and you know, I was talking with uh, somebody I'm going to be working with um, on the, um, uh, you know, um, on the marketing side, and they were, why do you want to go with them over them? And I was like, you know, they're very similar. It really came down to that guy, Rand Fishkin, I just learned so much from him already with SEO mods, yeah. you know, <laughs> and yeah. I was like, you know, truthfully, that's that's my deciding factor. I feel like I owe it to him. You know, I've just I continuously have just learned so much. So I, that's my answer. <laughs> you know, yeah. and on their end, they probably were like, "What?" But and if it's you know, something we I'm don't like, buy very often, and yeah. and we, we we you know we've got. It, it, I'm sure that isn't something you buy every day of the week. Then, no. then you know, choosing a company that you trust to keep you informed and you know is smart is actually. You know, really, you yeah. know, can't apologize.
it's not like you're just repaying a debt, David. You're actually choosing a company that you think is is into the game and mm-hmm. serious about it and and helpful. Yeah. And and that's the other you know that's the other thing is is we've got to we've got to get out of this idea that we're selling people and we've got to figure out are we really helping people when we mm-hmm. write this content? Are we giving them useful information? Mm-hmm. Or are we just sort of touting what we think we do best? Yeah. No, absolutely. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And um, if you can't start correctly, then it's going to be hard to end correctly. Well, cool. We, all right, to, to continue on, and that's a lot, a lot of good stuff there, Joan. Thank you for that. Um, to, to move forward here, uh, regarding capabilities, you know, what you can offer as a company through a mm-hmm. product or solution or service. If you find a highly rated buyer expectation, which means buyer expectations are basically what buyers expect, what, what, uh, what solutions they expect to be provided to them for if they invest in your solution, correct? Yeah, um, right. What, capa- what, okay. what are the attributes that matter to your buyers? You know, they really want it in purple, and you don't have it in purple. You only have it in blue and pink. You know, what yes. are we going to do, right? Exactly. So if you find a, a highly rated buyer expectation that your company or your solution can't deliver on and you don't have any way to address those particular needs, then do you, or to that exact expectation, but it's super highly rated, do you go ahead and just leave that completely out of your messaging? I mean, it sounds kind of logical. The answer is like, well, yeah, for sure, but would like to go ahead and point that out just in case it's not so yeah, I mean, obvious. if you can't, if you can't, if it's something you genuinely can't deliver, you know, I sometimes and without, you know, working with a specific example, it's tough. But if there's a workaround, you know, if this is, um, and and sometimes this does affect product strategy. You know, we we've, we've got to, hey, listen, we're seeing that buyers really need such, such and such and such. It's affecting our our sales cycle, and maybe this becomes a priority for your development of your product or service. But let's say there's something really big missing. Then what? What we there's really two parts of that. One is sure you can't talk about something you can't do. You don't want to lie about it. But the other well, part you of it know, is through well, the research. Let me, let me, let, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me let me make this a better question. Let's say okay. you can kind of do it. Let's say okay. you can not not that you can't completely do it, but it ranks like you're you're so so at it, and other people are great at it. I think that's a more real life example. Well, let's talk about that. I, I, I feel like the other one's like obvious. If you can't do it, well, then obviously don't miss. But let's say you your kinda can do it. What, what yeah. would you say there? Yeah, I, then then I want you to talk about it. If it's a very highly rated attribute, um, and remember we're talking mostly about marketing here, right? So if it's very very highly rated and you're still you don't have the best solution here, I want you to include it in your marketing messaging. And then I want you to get your sales organization, help your sales organization get prepared when they get in front of the buyer. And now they've got to deal with the detail around that. Prepare your sales organization that this is going to come up. Buyers are going to ask about this. Um, and, you know, you, here, here's the objection you're going to face. And work with your salespeople to come up with how they're going to explain the value of that workaround. But, gotcha. you know, and marketing's job is to help the company get into the buyer's consideration set, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, there's, if that's really super highly rated, then I would try. I, you want to get into the consideration set so long as you think that you've got a sellable workaround to it. Let me just take one other answer to that, though, David, and it, does, it is sometimes the case. If this is super highly rated by one segment of the market, one type of buyer, then we'd be looking to do to see if there's a different persona out there that wouldn't rank that attribute as highly. And um, and sometimes, and, and this is you know a more sophisticated application of buyer persona work. Sometimes what we've said to the client is, look, you know, there's parts of the market that are really going to care a lot about A, and you really kind of aren't that very good at A. So let's but let's go find a part of the market where B, C, and D, where you do shine, are more important. And then let's help your salespeople target the deals that they're going to win. Because you do uh-huh. have to worry a little bit, and that's the, why this is kind of a complicated topic, is you have to worry that if marketing is getting salespeople in front of buyers, that you really and truly, that kind of idea isn't good enough, 
then that you're just wasting the salespeople's time, and that's the worst thing you can do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, I mean, obviously, if it's super important to the buyer in your company, once those types of buyers, well, get better <laughs> at yeah, the end of better. the day. Yeah. You got to yeah. get better. You know, the company sales and marketing only can do so much. You know, you got to actually, and that's what always gets lost in sales and marketing conferences and stuff. Is the big assumption is that all the companies are great at doing what you're saying you can do, right? But that's not. That's obviously not the case. So, yeah, no, but, nobody's, but, nobody's great at everything. So it is. It is hard. You know, you've got to say okay, and I, that's really the value of this. And you know, you talked about those overlocking circles with here's what your buyers want to hear and here's what we have to say. In, in part of my keynote, I show that there's different overlapping circles with what buyers want to hear. Not all buyers want to hear the same thing. And uh -huh. so it's partially finding that group of buyers where you have the best possible overlap. And so one application of our work is to start to do segmentation and say, yeah, there's to start help to help clients anticipate which parts of the market are going to be have the best overlap with their with what they have to say, and um, so that's that can sometimes a very vital part of this. Because the other thing is, is when companies are trying to grow, you're talking about small companies and five percent everything. When small companies are trying to grow, they tend to say, "Hey, we're going to go market to everybody. That's our growth strategy." Because heck, we don't want to turn any business away. Uh, the reality is, and this is hard for a lot of companies to take on, is that there's probably parts of the market that you are better at serving than others. And the uh -huh. persona work can help you to figure that out, can help uh -huh. you to see different overlapping circles with what buyers, buy, different buyers want to hear different things. Here's our capabilities. They're static in your case that you're presenting to me today, David. We can't change what we do right now at least. But what uh -huh. we can do is go find someone, a set of buyers out there on the market that has a better um, alignment between what we can say and, and what they want to hear. Yeah, if you can get niche, you're golden. You know, if you can do that, yeah, that, yep. that's the way to go. So to kind of flip that other, you know, what we just were talking about, flip that on its head, what do you suggest people, companies do when you have a feature, solution, or service that you provide that is, is super amazing, super unique, super helpful, and uh, it's just the best thing in the world, but it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. resonate high with what a buyer wants necessarily. Although you know that they really do need this, but it, through your research and everything, you're not really finding that to be high on the list of what's going to resonate with them. Should that be completely left out of the marketing messages? Where, where should you go when that happens? And I think that this is very common with companies. They have it's something that's just like, this is amazing. Common. It's yeah, super that's common. It's super common. This is more sure. common than the first question you asked me. This, sure. is, this is so common. And, oh, boy, this is really hard medicine to take. Um, because, you know, nobody wants to hear that their baby isn't beautiful in the eye of the beholder, right? And Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, as a matter of fact, in about 30 minutes, I'm going to be telling a company this. So, um, <laughs> uh -oh. it's, good luck. It's, yeah, <laughs> and it's hard. And so here's what we do. We say, look, you know, if you're, you, first of all, we want to take all the findings we do have and recalibrate our thinking about it. So we've got this great capability about the way we bundle all these things together or we do this package solution, and buyers just don't see that yet. And we actually do a little bit of testing in our interviews around those value props so that not only do we understand what the buyer cares about when they make, have made a previous decision, but we introduce this new capability that our clients care about and we get the buyer's reaction. So now we have really good evidence that this isn't resonating with the buyer. And what we do is we'll say, look, we've got to find a way to connect this greatness that you guys believe in over here to something that does matter to your buyer. We've got to find a way to bridge, to make, to repackage the value of this great piece into something that, that has a hook into something that does matter to buyers. So it's about how we're going to, you know, we're marketers, right? We're going to find a way to present that value in a different way. And it's about getting inside that. So, you know, we have the most flexible solution 
and um, our buyers don't really care about flexibility, it's not high on their list, well, we're going to go over and find something that they do care about where flexibility would actually address that issue, and we're going to go mm-hmm. present it that way. Kind of like a breadcrumb type of thing, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And because it's about education, you know, and back when in early in my career, you know, I, I worked in companies where we were introducing products that nobody had ever bought before, services that nobody had ever bought before, that nobody cared about at all. And uh, how did we break into those markets and make those big? Well, we had to go find something they did care about and connect it. So here, here's, the heart, here's the rough medicine. Nobody wakes up today. Not one of your buyers woke up today and said, I have no problems. I think I'm going to go get educated about a new problem so I know how to spend my day. Hmm. It, it never yeah. happens. And, and so there's a lot of marketers that have been told, go educate your buyers. Well, this is really misapplied effort. Um, we're, we, yes, we're, try, we're trying to create those breadcrumbs. We aren't trying to educate buyers that they have a problem that they don't know they have. We're trying to educate them about the linkage between the problems that are top of mind to them and what we can do for them. Mm-hmm. Now, in regards so to kind of recap that, you know, the, the, again, there's a very common issue with companies that they have something that's amazing but you got to kind of get past step one and two to get to this to start even talking about that so when you're limited in the amount of space and what you can say in a marketing message obviously if you have long form content that's different but still the you know the shorter messaging so what you're suggesting suggesting is you're definitely going to need to lead with what buyers care about I know yep. that sounds like well, duh, but no, it's not a duh thing with it's companies because no. you know, <laughs> yeah. But do that and try to get, try to find as close to your unique capabilities to that question or to that problem that people are having, um, and get them in, and then it's going to be more of uh, the sales role, sales job, sales uh, person's job to then kind of bridge the gap to all these additional things that you have. But you you definitely need to lead with what buyers currently are caring about today. Is that is that what I've – have I heard that yeah. correctly? Exactly, okay. David. And I'll just take your example because this is hard to talk about in the abstract, but you said you were looking at an analytics solution, I believe it was. And, you know, mm-hmm. you went out and you had a set of things you were looking for. You would have never even stopped at that company that started to educate you and give you information if they hadn't initially addressed what you thought was important. But then yeah. once you got into the buyer's journey, after you started evaluating that, the fact that they were in, able to introduce new ideas to you was mm-hmm. value-add, and you said, hey, this is the company I want to do this. So, so you, you've already created your answer right there. That's actually an amazing example um, because – those kinds of tools, it really does feel like a fire hose, uh, you know, like I'm drinking from a fire hose. It's, yeah. it's like, what? I was like, this is too much, too much, too much, too much, right? And if that's what they would have been saying they do, like all those other things, it would have just, it would have glossed over me big time, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, that, the, okay, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, people really – can really understand that, then it it will really stop with the banging against the head. <laughs> I mean, banging your head against the wall with, with this. Like, we're great at this. Why don't people care about it? Well, you know, just accept that people don't know that they care about it yet, and right. and work around that. So, and, uh, don't, lead, given, and don't lead with don't lead with what's unique if it's something they don't care about. Yep. Okay. Well, that that's that's probably the probably the number one best thing I think we, we can pluck out of this podcast because it's such a common deal, and I think it's a very confusing question that people have. Um, so, yeah, that, thank, thanks. That, 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 that's amazing insight. Now, to kind of uh, to kind of close here, um, well, a couple couple last questions is, you know, now that we have all these areas and final messaging, let, let's just go ahead and, and, and give some examples of all the different places that people can use these, not specific examples, but different areas. Um, you know, SEM, pay-per-click ads, content marketing, retargeting, uh, what, what else? What else can we sell? Okay, now that you have these messaging, reminder, here are all the different areas that you can uh, utilize that messaging. 
Well, part of the reason why I say start with messaging is because, you know, fundamentally your message is, is embedded in every single marketing activity you do. So it's, it's almost like I'd have a hard time coming up with anything that this didn't affect uh, because it's always about the message. And, you know, I see so many marketing blogs and so forth talking about all these things, you know, the buyer's journey, they need a white paper, they need this, they need that. And I'm going, yeah, but, you know, that's just, that's just the embodiment of the message. And, frankly, buyers will, while they would like to see different formats and videos and all that, and they do have preferences, and we learn that in a buyer's journey, the most important thing is not about the format of the content, but the content of the content, the words in the content. So uh -huh. once you get this message right, there isn't any place that you shouldn't be using this message, every single place you do, including all the way into your sales training and sales playbook. Uh -huh. So obviously you're above the fold and home page, right? Absolutely. Like don't don't yeah. forget that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Don't forget that one because that's uh, that that's yeah. very static for many companies who aren't involved in an ongoing content approach where you're constantly updating your website or you know media companies who do that. M many 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 websites I've seen uh it's a set it and forget it thing. You know, it's yeah. just a static. You know, it just doesn't nothing ever happens to it. So you don't forget once you go through this exercise go you might need to do a revamp of your website at the very least you might need to do a revamp of the words you're using on your website even if you don't do a big redesign so so yeah don't forget that and basically Adele's saying use it everywhere use it anywhere and everywhere just be you know be consistent um once once you have your zeroed in on your strategy of of the of the messaging so um to kind of close you know what if a company is not great at copywriting like they got the information and they're like um, I have no, I have writer's block. I don't know what to say or how to say this. W where can they turn? Well, I mean, personally, I'm not a great, I don't think I'm a great copywriter either, so I go out and hire somebody to do that, and, and that's the best case. But you know what? I do want to emphasize this answer. You know, if, if you get, if you get the right kind of message, the copy, the creative aspect of writing the copy isn't as critical as it is when you're, I think a lot of people have tried to use copywriting in lieu of instead of saying something important. You know, we're going to go out there and try to be the most creative because we're saying the same thing as everybody else, so we're going to make it more, you know, and I think we get this from consumer marketing. You know, we get it from watching TV and TV ads and consumer marketing where somebody does something really clever and we remember it because it was clever. But the, 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 sheer, the, sheer matter, the sheer facts are that if you give your buyers useful answers to their questions, it doesn't have to be clever. It just has to be simple and concise. So mm -hmm. if, if, and the whole process of going through of what we talked about in the beginning of this podcast of looking at what your buyers want to hear, using their words, being ruthless about striking the jargon. No, so get rid of all the adjectives, all of them, all of the mm -hmm. fancy words, and just give them the information. And then copywriting isn't as important. It's, I, I still, like I said, I still use a copywriter. I think copywriters are amazing. I care about that a lot. But mm -hmm. it isn't as critical if you're on a tight budget and you don't have a copywriter and you don't, this isn't your best skill, um, join the club. And, and just make it simple and clear. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you're not, you're not de-emphasizing copywriting. You're just emphasizing the um, yeah. the meat and potatoes yeah. of it, you know, the actual exactly. stuff. Now, I think you did mention and you did give a resource if people wanted to get better at copywriting. What was it? Ann Hanley's book? Who, whose book was it again? Oh, yeah, Every, Everyone Writes by Ann Hanley. Is my Ann Hanley with Marketing yeah. Cross, right? Um, Absolutely my favorite book. I love Ann's uh, okay. style and tone. Talk about a great writer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... Yeah, she's she's kind of a big deal. Yeah, so yeah, I just I uh, couldn't remember, you know, where to direct somebody if you know they want to yeah, go ahead and get no, better at that. That'd be a good resource. Yeah. Okay, cool, awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, Adele. How um, how can people continue to learn from you? Well, so we're at buyerpersona.com dot uh, com on the uh, that's our website, or you can find us on Facebook, facebook dot com forward slash buyerpersona, or Twitter at buyerpersona. So. Pretty easy to find right. me. 
Yeah, I'm just typing buyer persona. Awesome. Well, Dell, uh, really appreciate your time, and um, you know, looking forward to uh, you know digging into some other challenges re in regards to messaging and, and buyer personas uh, in the future. Thanks so much for having me again, David. You're welcome, and thank you.